Welcome to iEducator. This is Teacher Jeff. I'm an educator and an engineer by profession. And today, we will discuss Chapter 10. And Chapter 10 is all about vision, light, and lighting. Now, in today's lesson, there are three key areas that I'm going to be highlighting today. First, we have the introduction. Second, we have the measurement of light. And lastly, we have lighting design considerations. And at this point, let me discuss to you first the introductory part of our lesson. First, let me introduce to you vision and the eye. So what do we mean by eye? If we say eye, it is a fluid-filled membranous sphere that converts electromagnetic radiation into nerve impulses that it transmits to the brain along the optic nerve. Now, as you can see in figure 10.2, light enters through a transparent outer covering called the cornea, which is indicated as letter A in the figure. Now, the cornea plays a major role in the refracting the light. Further refraction occurs as the light passes through the lens, which is indicated as letter C in the figure. The pupil lens, which is indicated as letter B in the figure, works like the aperture of a camera to vary the amount of light entering our eyes. Now, in bright light, the iris contracts, the pupillary diameter decreases, and only the central part of the lens forms an image on the retina. And on the other hand, in poor light, the iris expands and a large area of the lens is being used. And because the peripheral regions of the lens focus the light slightly in the front of the image formed by the central part or a characteristic of all simple lenses termed as spherical aberration. Slight blurring occurs when objects are viewed in poor light. This explains why the ability to discern detail or visual acuity is reduced in poor light. Using photographic terminology, it can be said that good lighting increases the depth of field of the eye. When the pupil is very small, the eye acts like a pinhole camera. All objects are focused on the retina irrespective of viewing distance. Increased depth of field reduces the need for optical adjustment by the lens. It is in this sense that it can be said that good lighting reduces the load on visual system. And as you can see in figure 10.3, it illustrates the optics of the depth of field phenomenon. So this is an example of the depth of field phenomenon, which is considered as one of the reasons we can see better in good rather than poor light. With a large aperture or letter A, only the image exactly at F is in sharp focus. And the other subtopic about the introductory part of this lesson, that would be the refractive apparatus of the eye. Now, the lens is held in place by a non-rigid membranous sling, and it divides the eye into two compartments. First, we have the anterior compartment, and second, we have posterior compartment. Now, what's the difference between the two? If we say anterior compartment, it refers to smaller anterior compartment contains a watery fluid called the aqueous humor, which is secreted by the ciliary body. On the other hand, if we say posterior compartment, it contains the jelly-like vitreous humor. Now, the humors help maintain the structural integrity of the eyeball and lens and supply the lens with nutrients. The surface of the eye is covered by a transparent membrane, the conjunctiva which supplies the cornea with nutrients. Dilation of blood vessels in the conjunctiva as a result of injury or infection causes the characteristic bloodshot or pink eye appearance known as conjunctivitis. Now, the refractive apparatuses of the eyes are the cornea, 
we have the humors and the lens. And if we see diopters, it is where the refractive power of the eye is being measured. Examples, a lens that can focus parallel light rays to a point one meter from its axis has a refractive power of one diopter. Another example, a lens that can focus parallel light rays to a point 50 centimeters from its axis has a refractive power of two diopters. And similarly, a lens that can focus parallel light rays to a point 10 centimeters from its axis has a power of 10 diopters. Now, the eye is considered to have a single lens 17 millimeters in front of the retina. When focusing on a distant object, it has a refractive power of 59 diopters and about 48 diopters of the eye's total refractive power is due to the cornea rather than the lens. This is because of the large difference between the refractive indices of the cornea and air is opposed to the smaller difference between the refractive indices of the lens and the humerus of the eye. Now, if the lens is removed from the eye, its refractive power is about 150 diopters, but inside the eye, it only contributes about 15 diopters when distant objects are being viewed. Now, this explains why removal of the lens of the eye due to the presence of opacities or cataracts in the lens does not lead to blindness. Corrective lenses can be supplied to replace the lost refractive power and compensate for any optical abnormalities. And on the other subtopic, we have blinking. If we say blinking, it is a reflex action that occurs every two to 10 seconds. Also, it is a voluntary forced closure of the eye. Now, what is then the function of blinking? The function of blinking is to actually stimulate tear production and flush out foreign objects such as dust particles from the surface of the eye. Now, tears, a deliate saline solution, lubricate our eye movements and are mildly bacterial. The eyelids can be likened to windscreen wipers. And that being said, at the inner corner of the lower eyelid is the nasolacrimal duct through which the tears are being drained. And tasks requiring concentration can reduce the blink rate. This can cause particles of dust to accumulate on and lead to drying and irritation of the surface of the eye, particularly if the relative humidity of the air is very low causing people to complain of hot or rough eyes. And next we have accommodation. And if we say accommodation, it is a process in which, unlike the cornea, the lens has variable refractive power, enabling light from both distant and near objects to be focused sharply onto the retina. Now cameras, usually have lenses of fixed focal length. If we say accommodation, accommodation or focusing of a camera depends on adjusting the distance of the lens from the focal plane or the photographic film. The refractive power of the eye is varied by changing the shape of the lens. And when distant objects are being viewed by the observer, the lens assumes a flat, this shape. When near objects are being viewed, the lens is fatter and rounder with greater refractive power as shown in figure 10.4. Now, as you can see in figure 10.4, most visual problems that are due to optical causes can be successfully corrected using appropriate lenses. Now, when viewing a distant object, the incident light rays are approximately parallel. They are actually refracted by the cornea and lens and produce an image on the retina. And in practice, any object more than about six meters away can be considered to be at infinity. When viewing distant objects, the incident light rays are divergent 
and greater refractive power is required to produce a sharp image on the retina. In young people, the refractive power of the lens can increase from 15 to about 29 diopters to bring close objects into focus. And the lens has about 14 diopters of accommodation in these individuals. And the mechanisms of accommodations is as follows. First, the lens has a natural convex shape. What we mean about this is that it is held in place by a capsule and a muscle known as the ciliary muscle. Second, the ciliary muscle is situated around the equator of the lens to which it is attached by ligaments. Now, and so for this matter, when a near object is fixated, the ciliary muscle contracts and moves closer to the lens in a sphincter-like action. This reduces the tension in the ligaments and permits the lens to adapt its natural convex shape, increasing its refractive power. And finally, when fixating a distant object, the ciliary muscles relax and move further away from the lens. This means to say that tension in the capsule is increased by the pull of the ligaments and the lens is pulled into a flatter shape with less refractive power. And therefore, the ciliary muscles have to contract to accommodate near objects and it is in the sense that the visual workload can be considered to be greater when viewing near rather than distant objects. Visual workload in closed tasks can be reduced by permitting micro breaks every few minutes in which the eyes are refocused on a distant object for a few seconds. And this is known as visual relief. Now, if we say the near point of vision, it is the closest distance at which an object can be bought into sharp focus. Now, in order for us to better understand this, let us have an example. So for example, a 16 year old can focus on an object less than 10 centimeters in front of the eye. However, the lens loses elasticity with age and in practice, this results in a reduction in refractive power. By the age of 60 years, the near point may have receded to 100 centimeters. This is why older people often need reading glasses or when reading a newspaper, for example, have to hold the paper at arm's length. By the age of about 50 years, the lens has only about two diopters of accommodations left. And after this, it can be regarded as completely non-accommodating, a condition known as presbyopia. So the result of presbyopia is that the eye becomes focused at a fixed distance, which varies between different people depending on the characteristics and conditions of the eye. Now, frequently, the fixed viewing distance in the presbyopic eye is intermediate between the previous near and far points and the person has to wear bifocal lenses. The upper part is set for distant vision and the lower part for near vision or mainly for reading. Now bifocal or trifocal lenses can restore a kind of stepwise accommodation to the presbyotic eye and in practice, if workplaces are adequately lit, the depth of field of the eye is increased and the net effect is to lower the requirements for accommodation. This explains why good lighting is very important in all facilities that are used by older people. And on another subtopic, which is visual defects, if we see asthenopia, it is diminished visual acuity associated with eye strain or pain in the eyes and headache. It is actually common in people who carry out near visual work for long periods and naturally reverses shortly after the cessation of close visual work. 
in a normal or emetropic eye, there is a correct relationship between the actual or anteroposterior dimensions of the eye and the power of its refractive system. Parallel light rays are focused sharply on the retina. Now, in myopia, light rays entering parallel to the optic axis are brought into focus at a point some distance in front of the retina. This can be caused by the eye being too long anterior posteriorly or due to excessive power of the refractive system. Myopia is sometimes referred to as nearsightedness because the near point is closer to the eye in myopic people for an equal amount of accommodation than it is to a healthy eye. Myopic individuals cannot bring distant objects into focus. Temporary myopia often occurs after a near object has been viewed for a period of time. Accommodation is not instantaneous because the lens requires time to change to a flatter shape when the ciliary muscle relaxes. Myopic individuals can often carry out closed tasks such as video work or sewing with ease but experience difficulties with tasks such as driving when target objects are more than 5 to 10 meters away. On the other hand, in hypermetropia, light rays entering parallel to the optic axis are brought into focus behind the retina. This can be caused by the eye being too short anteroposteriorly or by insufficient curvature of the refractive surfaces of the eye. Hypermetropia is sometimes referred to as farsightedness because the near point is farther away from the eye for an equal amount of accommodation than it is in a healthy eye. Hypermetropic individuals can be said to lack refractive power and may tire quickly when carrying out work in the viewing distance is short, such as using a VDU. And lastly, in astigmatism, there is an unequal curvature of the refractive surfaces of the eye, such as that of the refractive power is not the same in one plane as in another. When an object of complex shape is viewed, the retinal image may be out of focus in one plane, but not in others. Astigmatic individuals often perform quite well when given simple eye tests because the defect is corrected by the depth of focus of the eye. However, they may experience severe difficulties at night or when there is excessive glare. So how can we correct these defects then? When I say defects, I'm referring to nearsightedness, farsightedness, and astigmatism. Well, these defects can be corrected using appropriate lenses. Myopic individuals can be given diverging lenses to reduce the total refractive power of their optical systems. On the other hand, Hypermetropic individuals can be given converging lenses to increase their refractive power. Several problems may occur if defective vision is not corrected. Firstly, suboptimal vision may degrade performance. Secondly, excessive load on the muscles of the refractive system may cause visual fatigue. And lastly, the worker may adapt stressful body postures to client. And on the next key area, we have chromatic aberration. Now, in chromatic aberration, white light is a mixture of different wavelengths. A defect of all simple lenses is that light of a given wavelength is focused slightly nearer or further away than other wavelengths. This is known as chromatic aberration. Now, chromatic aberration can cause the outlines of objects to have purple or red fringes. 
the shortest and longest wavelengths. The refractive power of the eye is about three diopters greater for saturated blue than for saturated red. So blue objects are focused in front of red ones, and both cannot be in focus at the same time. Purple letters or characters on video screens may appear to have fuzzy edges for this reason. With a video using less saturated colors, the difference may be only one diopter. However, this may still be enough to cause startling visual effects such as chromostereopsis or the illusion of depth. And secondly, since blur is a stimulus for accommodation, and resolvable blur may destabilize the accommodation mechanism, making it hunt in vain to resolve the blur caused by the different focal points of the different colors. In other words, the onset of visual fatigue may be hastened. Reds, oranges, and greens can be viewed without refocusing, but cyan or blue cannot be viewed with red because they are at opposite ends of the visual spectrum. Chromatic aberration is exacerbated when the pupillary diameter is large, as in poor lighting. And aside from chromatic aberration, another subtopic that we have is what we call convergence. And remember, the eyes are a small distant apart, right? Now, when one is looking at a distant object, such as a mountain several kilometers away, each eye receives a similar image because the lines of sight of the two eyes are parallel and the distance apart of the two eyes is negligible compared to the distance of the viewed object. Now, when closer objects are viewed, the eyes converge on the object. Now, what I mean about this is that the lines of sight of each eye meet at the object. And secondly, convergence decreases with distance. This means to say that when viewing close objects, the two eyes view the object from slightly different angles so that the images cast onto the two retinas differ slightly. And lastly, the position of the eyes in their sockets is controlled by the virgin system. Lightly pressing one eye with a finger causes the perception of double images, which is known as diplopia. And long hours of close visual work may cause imbalances in the muscles controlling eye movement, a condition known as phoria, and increase the perceived effort required to carry out the task. And next subtopic that we have is the resting posture of the eye. Now, here, if people are asked to look ahead in the dark, the eyes assume the resting posture and monocular accommodation that the eyes assume under such conditions. And so for this matter, dark virgins and dark accommodation are the levels of binocular virgins and monocular accommodation that the eyes assume under such condition. And when looking straight ahead, the resting position of the virgins is about one meter and that of accommodation is of intermediate distance. Prolonged viewing of the near objects causes temporary proximal shifts in virgins and accommodation and these shifts are greater in people whose resting positions are farther away. This means to say that the onset of these shifts is related to the onset of visual fatigue. Further exposure to high visual demands can create virgence disparities, which express themselves as double vision caused by overconvergence to far objects and underconvergence to near objects. And another subtopic that we have is retina. So what is meant by retina? The retina is the most complex part of the human eye, consisting of layer of light sensitive cells connected to nerve fibers and is sometimes considered to be an extension of the brain or a little piece of brain lying within the eyeball. Now, unlike photographic film, the retina actively processes incoming information 
before passing it on to the brain via the optic nerve. Bright light causes chemical changes in the light-sensitive cells, which give rise to nerve impulses. The nerve fibers pass over the cells and converge to make up the optic nerve. Now, the point at which the optic nerve leaves the retina is known as the blind spot. The retina can be likened to an array of electronic light detectors linked in complex ways that act in an on and off fashion when activated by the incident photons. Now, the retina contains two types of light sensitive cells. We have rods and cones. Now, there are over 100 million rods and about 6 million cones. Rods are more sensitive to light than cones and are essential for scotopic or night vision. Bright light bleaches the rods, which renders them ineffective, and the cone or photopic system then comes into operation. And the next subtopic that we have is retinal adaptation. And if we say retinal adaptation, it is the ability of the retina to change its sensitivity according to the ambient lighting. Now, in order for us to better understand this, let us have an example. So for example, when walking from a darkened cinema into a sunny street, a temporary feeling of being dazzled is experienced. Now, because of this, the diameter of the pupil decreases to reduce the amount of light entering the eye. The rods are bleached and the photopic system quickly comes into operation. On going from a bright area to a dark one, the pupil actually increases in size and chemical changes take place in the retina as the rods slowly come into operation. Now the question is, how long will it take for a certain person to fully adapt to dark conditions? Well, full adaptation to dark conditions can take up to 20 minutes. So it is important not to expose the dark adapted eye to sudden bright lights since even brief exposures will degrade scotopic vision for some time afterwards. This can happen to motorists driving along unit roads at night when oncoming cars have badly adjusted or undimmed headlights. Extra light is usually provided at the entrances and exits to tunnels for similar reasons to smooth the transition between light and dark and provide more time for retinal and behavioral adaptation. Now, as you can see in figure 10.6, this is an example of sensitivity of rods and cones. Now, as you can see, it depicts the sensitivity of the photopic and scotopic systems to light of different wavelengths. Now, the systems are differentially sensitive to light of different wavelengths. Both are maximally sensitive to light in the middle of the spectrum, which is perceived as blue-green, green and yellow. Violet and red are less readily sensed, which implies that in order for a red object to appear as subjectively bright as green one, more illumination is required. It is unfortunate that red is normally used to signal danger, since the retina is less sensitive to red than other colors at the same illumination level. And the next subtopic that we have is what we call color vision. Now, as you can see, the output of the photopic system is experienced as color vision. Now, three types of cone cells with different spectral sensitivities have been identified. And because the absorption spectra of their light-sensitive pigment overlap, a given wavelength of visible light will cause the three types of cones to respond in varying degree. And second, the result is a pattern of cone outputs, which is the signature of the particular wavelength. And because of this, different wavelengths give rise to different cone output patterns, which are interpreted as different colors by the brain. Now, this being said, 
the cone output patterns are then transmitted to the brain where they give rise to the color perception seems straightforward and compatible with our everyday experience. And finally, the white light consists of light of many different colors such as wavelengths supports the component process explanation of color vision. For example, red and green light sources can be combined to give a yellow color, which matches monochromatic yellow, even though the wavelength which that rise to the perception of yellow is not present. Now, these metameric matches are evidence for a component process view of color vision. The cone output pattern caused by the mixed wavelength stimulus is identical to that caused by the monochromatic source. So the same color is being perceived. All right, so that concludes our first key area of our lesson for today. And so for that matter, let us move on to our second key area, which is the measurement of light. Now, the measurement of light is very essential in the design and evaluation of the workplaces. Because the eye adapts to light levels, automatically compensating for any changes in illumination, subjective estimates of the amount of light in a work area are likely to be misleading. Data concerning the visual response of the eye have been used to define lighting measures. Now, the radiant reflux arriving at a surface is weighted according to the eye's sensitivity to each of a number of wavelength intervals. And the total incident radiant flux after weighting is known as luminous flux. Now, if we say photometry, it is the measurement of light. And the main photometric units are luminous intensity, luminous flux, luminance and we also have illuminance if we say luminous intensity the si unit of luminous intensity is the candela or cd an imaginary point source of luminous intensity one candela will emit light in all directions a source of greater intensity will emit more light now in both cases we can imagine a sphere of light spreading out for the source. Now, clearly, the intensity of the source itself does not depend on the distance from which it is viewed. However, the strength of the light at the edges of the imaginary sphere will depend on viewing distance. Next, we have luminous flux. And we also have luminance. Now, the luminance of an object depends on the light it emits or reflects towards the eye. It corresponds roughly to brightness, although brightness perception depends on other factors such as contrast. In the example above, if the inside of the sphere is a perfect reflector of light, then the luminance will be the same as the illuminance. The percentage of the incident light that is reflected by a surface depends on the reflectance of the material. Reflectance is defined as the ratio of luminance to illuminance. White paper has a reflectance of about 95%, white cloth about 65%, newspaper about 55%, plain wood about 45%, and not black paper has a reflectance of about 5%. Now, if we know the illuminance of the surface or the surfaces in a room, for example, by measuring it with a light meter, we can select materials of appropriate reflectances for each of the surfaces in order to achieve a balance of surface luminances in the room and ensure that the ratio of luminances of adjoining surfaces is not exceeded. Now, as you can see on the figure or in table 10.3, much effort has been applied over many years to the drafting of standards for the illumination of workplaces. Standards differ from country to country. Now, as you can see in table 10.3, 
it presents recommended illuminances for different work situations. Some other illuminances values that are found in more extreme situations have been included in the table to provide context. United States of America readers should refer to the IES Lighting Handbook for up-to-date and detailed recommendations, whereas readers outside the United States may find the CIBSE code for the interior lighting useful. It can readily be seen that the eye can operate under an extremely wide range of illuminance levels, owing largely to the differential sensitivity of the photopic and scotopic system. On another subtopic, we have contrast and glare. Now, if you may know, the function of the eye is not so much to detect light, but to detect luminance discontinuities between objects in the visual field. It is the difference in luminosity between an object and its surroundings that make it visible rather than the light the object reflects. Now, a person wearing opaque spectacles can detect the presence of light but not the presence of object. Now, the retina functions more like an edge detector than a light meter. Special cells called Horizontal cells are part of a network of cells interposed between the rods and cones and the fibers of the optic nerve. Now, this means that if one part of the retina is stimulated by a bright light, the horizontal cells inhibit the adjacent photoreceptors. This has the effect of increasing the difference in the firing rates of the stimulated and unstimulated parts of the retina and serves to enhance the perceived contrast between the stimulus and its surroundings, which has the effect of sharpening the contours of objects, facilitating their detection. And second, the direction of gaze is involuntary drawn to bright objects in the visual field. And this is known as phototropism. Now, if we can notice, if you go to jewelry shops or pawn shops, they usually display their wares on black velvet cloth under bright lights to obtain maximum contrast. The intention being to stimulate a phototropic response in passersby. And finally, one of the most important considerations in the design and evaluation of lighting systems is to ensure appropriate contrast between objects in the visual field. Now, the luminance contrast between two surfaces is given by the difference between the luminances of the brighter and dimmer surface expressed as a percentage of the brighter. Note that contrast does not depend on the absolute brightness of the surfaces. And the luminance ratio is the ratio of the luminance of a work area to that of its surroundings. Now, recommended maximum luminance ratios have been proposed. So that would be three is to one between a task and its immediate surroundings to 10 is to one between the task and the walls, floors, etc. Now, it is usually suggested that the task should be the brightest area in the visual field to take advantage of the phototropic response. Now, this precludes the use of materials such as white formica for desktop materials since the luminance ratio between white paper and the desktop will be too low. Wood or pastel colored finishes are preferable from this point of view. Now, if we say glare, glare usually occurs when there is an imbalance of surface or object luminances in the visual field or the brighter sources exceeding the level to which the eye is adapted. Although the retina is able to adapt to different levels of luminance so as to operate over a wide range of conditions, it is not able to adapt selectively to large, simultaneous discontinuities in luminance in the visual field. For example, 
if the ambient luminance is high compared to the task luminance, then the retina will adapt to the former rather than the latter, and the task will appear dim and will be more visually demanding. This can happen when VDU screens are placed against a window such that users face the window. If the illuminance in a room is very low, the retina will dark adapt and will be more vulnerable to the effects of glare from task elements or extraneous sources. Now, the sources of glare includes the sun, bright or naked lamps, or reflections of shiny objects. And the categories of glare are divided into two parts. First, we have the disability glare. And second, we have discomfort glare. Now, the difference between the two is that if we say disability glare, it increases task demands. And on the other hand, if we say discomfort glare, it does not increase task demands. Now, disability glare occurs when objects brighter than the task interfere with the detection and transmission of visual task data. Extraneous light sources may increase the adaptation level of the retina, making the task appear dimmer than it really is. And discomfort glare may occur in offices, for example, when one or more bright objects are seen peripherally. All right, so that concludes our discussion for the second key area. And finally, uh, let's move on to the last key area, which is lighting design considerations. Now for visual comfort and to meet visual demands, the following should be considered. First, we have a suitable level of illumination. Second, a balance of surface luminances. Third, avoidance of glare. And finally, we have temporal uniformity of lighting. Now, let us discuss illumination levels. So although early research indicated that improvements in productivity were possible when illumination levels were increased, more does not necessarily equal better. In fact, high levels of illumination may increase or may increase glare rather and may wash out important visual details. And if illumination levels are inadequate, increasing them may improve performance, but a region of diminishing returns will be reached as non-visual limits to performance, such as motivation, fatigue, or manual dexterity become increasingly important. Now, this being said, older workers generally require higher levels of illumination than younger workers owing to the loss of refractive power and changes in the light transmitting media of the internal structures of their eyes and the next key sub area we have lighting surveys now remember that ergonomists are not illumination engineers however they should be able to use a light meter now as you can see in figure 10.7 that is an example of a light meter. Light meters can be used to measure illuminance levels on the work surfaces in offices, shops, factories, etc. And the readings can be compared with the levels recommended in published standards as shown in Table 10.3. Now, as you can see in Table 10.3, these are examples of recommended and naturally occurring illuminances. So for example, for the area or activity, uh, we have clear sky in summer. So the recommended um, and naturally occurring illuminances, that would be 150,000 lux, okay, and so on and so forth. And the next key subtopic, we have balance of surface luminances. Now in practice, a balance of surface luminances is achieved by specifying appropriate illuminances and corresponding reflectances of the surfaces in a room. Now, detailed specifications can be found in the publications of the IES, which stands for Illuminating Engineering Society, and ANSI, 
which stands for American National Standards Institute. And examples of this information are shown in Table 10.4. Now, this is Table 10.4. This is all about the ANSI recommended reflectances for offices. For example, under surface, you have ceiling. So it's reflectance that would be between 80 to 90%. And suitable materials or finishes recommended would be white paint or matte. Another, we have furniture and its reflectance is between 25 to 50%. And its suitable materials or finishes that would be wood or matte that would be unpolished, and so on and so forth. Now remember that there are two types of lighting, right? First, we have direct lighting, and second, we have indirect lighting. Now what's the difference between the two? Now if we say direct lighting, it is often used to illuminate sculpture because the shadows produced have a modeling effect. Now, the areas of light and dark enhance the 3D appearance of the works by emphasizing differences in depth. Angled direct lighting is useful for enhancing the surface texture of materials such as cloth or wood and can be used in the production of these materials to aid inspections and quality control. However, direct light can reflect off desktops or surfaces and cause indirect glare and sharp luminance discontinuities between lit and unlit surfaces. On the other hand, if we see indirect lighting, when indirect lighting is used, most of the light is directed onto the ceiling and walls, which reflect it back. And therefore, objects are illuminated from many different directions at once. A smoother distribution of luminances is obtained and shadows are reduced. Direct and indirect lighting can be combined to achieve a balance of surface luminances and minimum glare. Now, in a well-illuminated office, for example, all large objects and major surfaces should have a similar luminance and surfaces in the middle of the visual field. A contrast ratio of no more than three is to one. Contrasts at the sides of the visual field should be avoided. A balance of surface luminances can best be achieved in practice by using materials with different reflectances in a room. And aside from these, we also have avoidance of glare. So remember that glare can be reduced by choosing a suitable combination of direct and indirect lighting. Now, as you can see in figure 10.8, there's actually a lamp on the working table, correct? Now, this is an example of direct lighting because, as you can notice, most of the light is directed towards the target in the form of a cone. Now, this produces hard shadows and sharp contrasts between illuminated and non-illuminated areas. Indirect lighting is reflected off other surfaces in a room and produces a smoother transition between surface luminances and reduces shadows. And the next key area or next subtopic rather, that would be color rendering and artificial light. Now the apparent color of an object depends on the spectral composition of the incident light and the wavelengths of the object reflex. Now, in order for us to better understand this, let us have an example. So supposing in broad spectrum white light, an object that reflects long wavelengths and absorbs the rest would appear red. Now, the same object when viewed under artificial light, Deficient in long wavelengths would appear reddish gray or brown. An object that appeared bright red under white light would appear black when illuminated by monochromatic blue light. On the other hand, the light emitted by a source can be described in terms of the relative amounts of different wavelengths of which it is composed. This means to say that monochromatic sources emit a narrow band of wavelengths. In fact, 
objects that reflect these wavelengths will appear very bright when illuminated by the monochromatic source and objects that do not reflect the wavelength at all will appear black. For example, sodium street lights emit a narrow band of wavelengths and appear yellow. Most objects illuminated by them appear various shades of yellow or gray and can only be distinguished by the contrast or brightness differences between them. Now, a monochromatic light source can be said to have poor color rendering ability because it does not reveal the way objects differentially reflect incident light according to its wavelength composition. And the color rendering properties of lights also influence the atmosphere in a room. Now, what do we mean by this? This means that although there is still debate about whether environmental color has psychological effects, the ambient illumination can have social implications because of the way different light sources render the complexion of a person's face. For example, incandescent lights enhance skin tones and can facilitate social interaction through the creation of a warmer atmosphere. Now, because of their lower luminous efficacy and the higher heat production, incandescent lamps are not normally used for general lighting in offices and factories. However, they may be used to advantage in interview and meeting the rooms where social interaction occurs and in areas such as lifts or elevators and toilets where mirrors are often fitted onto the walls. Now, as you can see in table 10.5, it summarizes some color rendering properties and applications for different commercially available lamps. For example, for incandescent lamp, the, CR, the CRI rather is between 90 to 99 and the luminous efficacy is low and applications or comments, this can be applied at home, hotels, rooms, dedicated to social interactions. And another example that would be uh, mercury fluorescent. So it's CRI that would be between 50 to 60 and the luminous efficacy is a medium and this can be applied in general illumination. So long life and weekends red and so on and so forth. All right, I think that's a good place to stop. If you have questions, please let me know on the comment section below. And if you like this video, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button for the latest updates. Thank you.